We're in chapter 18, making our way through 2 Samuel. Tonight, we have seven chapters left to go in the book. I've been just blessed going through the life, mostly of David now, since chapter 16 of 1 Samuel. And now we've been looking at David as a king, as a father, as a man after God's own heart. That's what the Bible records of David in 1 Samuel 13 as well as Acts chapter 13. It declares before David became a king and long after David had gone that he was a man after God's own heart. So that is our, our target. That's our objective. That is what we're doing as we're going through the book is trying to draw from the Word of God those things that would create in us that ability to say, I, I want to be and I believe I am becoming a man after God's own heart. That will always be and should always be, brother, your study in the Word of God. Always as you go through the Word of God, always be attentive to how your Father operates, your Father in heaven. That's what I do. When I read through the Word of God, I'm always watching, looking, and paying attention. How does my Father operate? How does He think? How does He behave? How does he react to situations. What are his commandments? So I'm, I'm watching him. Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen my father. So in the Gospels, I can see the father in the life of the son. In the Old Testament, I see the father interacting with individuals, with the nation. And he has a lot to say. And, and he does a lot of things in the Old Testament that help me to understand how he is. So... The better I understand him, the better my relationship will be with him. When you talk to people and they talk about God and you realize they really don't have a sense of who God is. They, they look at God very vaguely. Oftentimes they talk about God incorrectly. They'll pick a particular attribute of God to the neglect of everything else that is God. And they kind of have a tunnel vision. You know, they've isolated one of his actions and so that gets amplified magnified and it, it, it shadows and it clouds out everything else so there's a lot about god the father in the bible for us to to read and to always be looking and the more i understand it the more i'll be able to be that man after god's own heart that david was so we can probably say of david david had a keen way of knowing his father's heart so he could be like his father like father like sin. Exactly. So that's the idea. That's our goal. We're trying to be those men after God's own heart. In our study last week, we saw the death of David's once dear friend, his chief counselor, Ahithophel, a man who David said we used to go in the throng of the assembly to the house of God and worship. Him and Ahithophel would head to the house of the Lord. and They would be there just worshiping the Lord together. But he says, you've lifted up your heel against me. And so Ahithophel turned against David. We saw in our study that Ahithophel again gave counsel to Absalom, but then for some strange reason, Absalom defers to Hushai to see what he might have to say. He comes out with what appeared to be a better plan, which in reality, according to the scripture says, wasn't actually a better plan. Ahithophel had the better plan to get David, but God was there to, to intercede for David. And so Ahithophel's counsel wasn't listened to. Hushai's counsel was listened to, and it bought David some time. And, of course, Hushai sent word to David, get out of here. Ahithophel wants 12,000 guys, and he's coming after you, man. So put some distance between you and him. And so David moved out. Tonight we're going to see another death of somebody special in the life of David. It's going to be his number three son, Absalom. David lost his firstborn son, Amnon, when we saw Absalom killed his brother for having raped his sister, Tamar. We saw David earlier lose this first son that he had with Bathsheba, and it was the son that came out of their adulterous relationship. So that's two sons that he has lost. So tonight's study, we're going to see a third son that David's going to lose, and that's his third-born Absalom. The whole deal, as we saw last week, chapter 17, verse 14, where it says that the Lord might bring disaster on Absalom. 
When you look, how would I phrase this? There's two pictures here, the little picture and the big picture. We're, we're looking at the little picture. We're looking at Absalom. We're looking at David. We're looking at the destroyed relationship. We're looking at the human reaction to bitterness, anger, resentment. We're looking at the overthrow of his father's kingdom. We're looking at a father becoming a... We're looking at all that. That's the little picture. The big picture is God's view. God determined to bring disaster upon Absalom. That's the big picture. What God does is the big picture, oftentimes what we see, and, and we get confused between the two. Well, if Absalom was as bad as he was, then he, you know, he should have got her. If David did all these wrong things, maybe it wasn't Absalom's pic, uh, fault. And we could, we could banter on the little picture, but I look at the big picture. When it says God is determined to bring disaster upon Absalom, I realize Absalom has made an enemy of God. And so when, when God determines and he tells us in his word, this is what I'm doing against Absalom. He is going to die. And, and when you see how he dies, it's almost kind of tragic, but it's God who determined to bring disaster against Absalom. Remember at the end of chapter 11, when David had the affair, he, he tried to get Uriah to come home. It didn't work out. Then David sent by the hand of Uriah a letter back to Joab, put him in the most intense battle place, and then retreat and, and leave him to be a casualty. When it all happened, was all done, and word got back to David, he said, oh, the sword kills one as well as the other, and it looked like, well, you know, that's a done deal. But it tells us in the final verse of chapter 11 that the thing that David did displeased the Lord. So it's not the end of the story. The Lord will have the final say. And so we saw chapter 12. We saw what Nathan said to David on behalf of the father. What Nathan said to David, remember, was, was the words of the father. The father said, you have despised me. The father said to David, you have despised my word. The father said to David, you have given great occasion to the enemies of God to blaspheme my name. And so there's consequences. So we're looking at, again, it's the big picture are the consequences that David has to bear because he said, I will raise up adversity from your own house he said, the sword shall never depart your house. So this is what David is going through, and that's part of the big picture. So it's almost interesting when you look at it, and sometimes confusing. David, this is going to be the result. From your own house, somebody's going to rise up against you. But God says, that guy who's going to rise up against you, I'm going to rise up against him. We want to go, well, which is it? It happens to be both. Learn in the Bible Sometimes it's both. We, we want everything to be straight and linear and, and A, B, C, D. I find the Bible goes A, B, D, A, B, C, D, E, G, Q, R, L, M. And it's like, whoa, wait a minute, hold on. And, and God's ways are past finding out, Isaiah 55 said. He said, as the heavens is above the earth, so are my ways. So sometimes I cannot figure God out. God doesn't work in my concept of, of understanding and reason. He says this about this guy, but then, wait a minute, well, if that's David's judgment, leave him alone. No, 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 now I'm against Absalom. So you, you get this sometimes when you, you start thinking critically of the Word of God and not in a negative sense. I just try to think out the Word of God, how everything's operating, and, and, and want to understand it. And I realize there's a lot in the Bible, brothers, that is not understandable. One of the things I used to appreciate about Pastor Chuck, he died at 86. He had 66 years of ministry. I'll be 66 in November. Pastor, and he went to be, he moved to be with Jesus almost 10 years ago, October 13th. So, and he would teach the Bible, and he knew the Bible so well, he would just sit there, and then he'd come across something that was just hard to understand, and he'd say, and you know, fellas, I don't quite understand it yet. I'm just waiting for more information. And when he would say that, that would be so relieving to me because I'm thinking I, I want to understand everything in the Bible, but a man with so many years in ministry and so much depth in ministry would say, I don't understand it yet. It just lets me know, I don't think I'll understand everything in the Bible. There are going to be things you won't understand, brother. So he, Pastor Chuck used to always say this too, and it's profound the things that he taught us. Never give up what you do know for that which you don't know. 
And when you get to a place in the Bible and you can't figure it out, just wait. More information will come, but you know things in the Bible that are true. There are many things in the Bible you know. You know God loves you. He demonstrated that, and while you're yet the ungodly, Christ died for you, Romans 5. 8. He already proved it. No questions asked. So he loves you. He, he promised you eternal life. Those are the things you know. So when you get to the things in the Bible and you start going, I can't negotiate these two things, well, you know what? Give it time. Maybe more information will come. Or, guess what? You may never negotiate those two things. Predestination, free will, which is it? Calvinism or Arminianism, which is it? Church has been battling that since the days of John Calvin himself. You know what it is? It's both. You say you've got to get off the fence. You're in the middle on the fence. I suggest to you stay in the middle of the street and don't go to the sides of the sidewalk. Pastor Chuck said when it taught predestination, I taught predestination out of the Bible. And when the Bible teaches free will, I teach free will out of the Bible. And I'll let everybody else figure out that you get sometimes what seems to be opposing truths and we want to say, well, one of them has to be true and then we start neglecting the other side of the truth and arguing against it. You don't want to do that. So there's just things in the Bible that are, are like that and we look at the life right here of, of Absalom and what's going to happen. You look at what David's going through and uh, like I say, sometimes you can't figure it out. What we find back again on the text that Absalom did follow Hushai's advice rather than take the 12,000 and send Ahithophel he decides he's going to go to war he is amassed from remember Dan to Beersheba this military force he has already crossed the Jordan River everything that is east of the Jordan you've got Reuben in the south Gad in the middle half the tribe of Manasseh to the north everything east of the Jordan is known as the land of Gilead so when you read about Gilead in the Bible, it is always the east side of the Jordan River where two and a half tribes of Israel dwell. The northern tribe was Manasseh, but half of them also lived on the west side of the Jordan River. So they were on both sides. So, so Absalom's over there too. He's pursuing his dad. David went up to Mahanaim, and he's up there hanging out. He ran into some good friends. They brought a bunch of provisions out because everybody was weary from the wilderness trek. And so that's what we're going to look at as we, we pick up the story tonight. In 18 verses 1 through 5. And David numbered the people who were with him and set captains of thousands and captains of hundreds over them. Then David sent out one-third of the people under the hand of Joab, one-third under the hand of Abishai, the son of Zariah, Joab's brother, and one-third under the hand of Ittai the Gittite. And the king said to the people, I also will surely go with you myself. But the people answered, He shall not go out, for if we flee away, they'll not care about us. Nor if half of us die, they'll not care about us. But you are worth 10,000 of us now, for you are now more help to us in the city. And the king said to them, Whatever seems best to you, I will do. So the king stood beside the gate, and all the people went out by hundreds and by thousands. Now the king had commanded Joab, Abishai, and Ittai, saying, Deal gently for my sake with the young man Absalom. And all the people heard when the king gave all the captain's orders concerning Absalom. So David knows he's cornered. There's got to be a fight. So now he moves into commander-in-chief role. He begins to tactically build three forces of his army, and he's, he's already got a battle plan. I think we're going to see that in a little bit. He's got a strategy. David is a warrior. When David killed Goliath, the testimony of David was already, he was a valiant man. And I think I might have mentioned last week that Bible commentators, and especially children's curriculum, has it extremely wrong concerning David when you see pictures of this little boy going out against this giant. David may have been 16 years old, but in those days, 16 years old was a man. He's not like some of the sons that are living in the homes today. They're at Walmart, their pajamas, and all they do is play video games. That's not what, that's not what you'll find in the Bible. David was already a valiant man so that when he killed Goliath, Saul immediately put him over the men of war. You wouldn't put a little young guy who hasn't hit puberty yet over your men of war. That would just be stupid. 
But Saul had enough respect already, and the testimony of David from the Bible already was that he was already a valiant man. He was already with that, that sense of war. When he killed Goliath, what did he do? He took his head back to his tent. He had a tent there already with his brothers when he went to visit. The only reason why he had to stay home is he was the youngest brother and somebody had to watch those stinking sheep. But dad one day cut him loose with a care basket and, and that was the time he went up and he, he ended up killing Goliath the giant. So he, he's, he's been a warrior from his youth. He, he knows what he's doing. He left Jerusalem. Then he left Judah. He's crossed the river, but Absalom, is, he's in pursuit. So David, he has to fight. He says, I'm going to go with you guys to battle. Notice that. It's interesting. I also will surely go out with you myself. And that would seem to be, well, everybody just assumes that. That might also be something that David said in response to what we saw in chapter 11. In the spring of the year, when kings go out to battle, David remained at Jerusalem. And one day when David got up from his nap, he went up onto his roof, and behold, David saw a woman bathing, and he beheld her and sent for her and took her. So perhaps David is going, I'm going to war, guys. I'll be, I'm saddling my ride. I'll, I'll, I'll be there with you guys. So maybe, you know, that is showing us that, that David understood that, man, last time I stayed home during the battle, it did not go well with me. So I'm going to join you guys, and I'll, I'll be there. And, and notice this. They insist that David does not go with them to the battle. They know that David is the primary target. And so when I read the text, I, I see Ahithophel and Absalom's communication. And it's very clear that Ahithophel said, give me 12,000 guys and I'll just kill the king. That's the one we want. Absalom, that's the one you want. And as, as these forces are coming out, both sides realize this isn't a battle of of forces. This isn't a battle of, of two opposing armies and factions. This is a battle of we just want to kill one guy. We got one high value target, King David. And once we kill David, we're done with the deal. And these guys know it too. So they're saying, You're worth 10,000 of us. Man, when you die, all hope is gone. So no, you can't go. You need to stay in, in, in the city. At this point in time, David is getting older. David may actually be now in his early, early 60s. He, he's not the young man anymore. His beard is no longer dark. He's got gray in the hair, gray in the beard. I always get a kick. I saw a picture of myself at, actually two days ago. I was going through some old hunting pictures. And my wife, Carol, started laughing, you know, and I looked at the picture. My hair is, only Chris has hair. Well, maybe, Steve, my hair is that dark, believe it or not. Dark as yours. Dark hair. And, and now it's like white, you know, and she thought that was funny. I didn't think that was funny. It wasn't nice. So, so David, he, he's getting up there in years. We're going to find out as we get to chapter 21 when Ishbi Benab comes to fight with David. David's losing the fight. And they tell David, you ain't going to war no more. So, you know, you can only do what you can do. And you guys that are up in my age, you know, when you all of a sudden one day, I remember, I think it was 33, there was two kids at a church. It was Easter Sunday after church, we were having a barbecue. And I had two guys, they just graduated from high school, both played on the football team. And I've always been very fast. I, I always had wheels. When I pl my favorite sport was baseball. I wasn't a hard or a long ball hitter. I wasn't a great glove. I played third base, but I had wheels. I was a base stealer. Ty Cobb is my hero for you older guys who know who Ty Cobb might. Don't talk to me about Ricky Henderson or nothing like that. Let's talk about Ty Cobb. I'll, I'll, steal, er I'll steal every base from you, man. That was my goal. And I played football with them, and I had a little bit of a hard time catching up. And I thought, uh-oh, I'm, I'm getting older. Something happened at 43, and it's so far back I can't remember because I'm so old now. But I do remember at 43, it was another time when I suddenly went, uh-oh, I'm getting older. And, and, you know, as the years go by, you've got less energy, less stamina, less strength. It, it's, it's like, man, this stuff is sneaking away. And, you know, 
You may be as good as you once were, but you know what? <laughs> you only do it once, man, like the song says, because I tell you what, you know, your pride says you can do it, but your body says, no, you can't. And a lot of times it's your body that's right, and your pride loses to it. So David's getting old. It's just like everybody. It just happens. It's going to come, and, and it's coming to David. He's just getting old. So David, if you die, you're no good. And, and like you say, I, he, he's getting older now, so it's better if you just stay home. He leaves him with a command before they go, and he speaks to his three captains, Joab, Abishai, Ittai, and everybody hears this. It's audible. It's vocal. Everybody hears it. Deal gently with the young man. Deal gently. How do you go to war and deal gently with your adversary who wants to kill you? You ever think about that? How do you deal gently? You know, you, excuse me, hold on a second. Can you stop shooting? I'd just like to talk to you for a minute. I don't think that's going to work. So the idea David is thinking is just when, when you corner him, capture him, don't hurt him, don't tie his hands too high, tight with the ropes. Put him casually and gently up on the horse that you're going to bring him back. Make sure he has enough water and, and a snack to eat for the ride over. How, how do you deal gently with someone who hates your guts and wants to kill you? But David makes this public command to his guys, and you're going to see how it's going to play out in the rest of the, the study that we look at tonight. So verse 6. So the people went out into the field of battle against Israel, and the battle was in the woods of Ephraim. The people of Israel were overthrown there before the servants of David, and a great slaughter of 20,000 took place there that day. For the battle there was scattered over the face of the whole countryside, and the woods devoured more people that day than the sword devoured. So th they go to battle. If they went out in hundreds and thousands, David may have had 2,500 guys, maybe that many. If Absalom had men from Dan to Beersheba and 20,000 died, I have to assume his forces were probably up in the range of 50,000 maybe. And so here's David with a very small force against a very giant force, and they're going to battle in the woods of Ephraim. Now, Ephraim is on the west side of the Jordan with the other tribes, the other nine and a half tribes, okay? So the woods of Ephraim on the Gilead side are just named that, but they're not in the tribe of Ephraim. So that could be a little confusing if you follow your tribal geography. Remember, there's 12 tribes of Israel there, like the 13 colonies that we originally had. Same thing. So, you know, you hear names like Ephraim. That was one of the tribes, but that was on the west side, but these woods of Ephraim are on the east side of the Jordan River. And it describes the geography, the topography, the landscape as having killed more people than the sword did. So that area is very treacherous, it's very steep, it's, it's very dangerous as you travel. It's just not a bunch of flat land. We don't have a big valley and a flat or just some rolling hills going on. You got a very treacherous area. And this is why it seems to me, looking at David, and I may be reading between the lines, but that David knows the topography. David is a warrior. He's going to use everything to his advantage. You're outnumbered. You better be a whole bunch smarter than your adversary is. You better hope that you can find a weakness that your adversary is not thinking about, and you got to capitalize on it. you got to catch him. you got to surprise him. You can't overpower him. You don't have more guys. Your, your, your military weaponry is, is equal, sword, spears, slingshots, bow and arrows. So it's not like you got, you know, an air assault first would be great, you know, and, and, and you could destroy, you know, 30% of the advancing troops, and then we'll come back with artillery for the next third, and by the time we get into infantry battle, you know, it ought to be pretty close to two against one. You don't get those choices. So I, I believe David is smart, and he's looked at the countryside, and, and I wouldn't be surprised if David's three units that broke up got to places where they would anticipate them guys coming, that they would come down with a very offensive force and drive these guys to the cliff sides. And these guys were falling off cliffs, hitting rocks, hurting themselves, dying, because it says that the woods killed more than the sword killed. So it, it lets you know when you think about that, 
what in the world in the mountains, whatever? Guys didn't turn around and run and slam into a cedar tree. I don't think that happened. So I, I, in my mind, I think, oh, what would it be? I could see David. I could see guys where, where they would be traveling perhaps through a, a little, you know, hillside, kind of cliffy, and David's guys would just come and, and just come down and attack them, and they would get scared, driven back, and guys were falling over cliffs and rocks and things like that and, and dying. So, again, I think David had a plan when he, you know, he, he thought about that, and I believe he used the landscape to his advantage. 20,000 died. This is a pretty successful slaughter. Didn't Hushai warn Absalom? If there's a great slaughter of the people and word gets out, all the mighty guys, even the guys that are like lions, they're going to go running. So he's right. When, when David's guys fight, they're mighty men. They're, they're warriors, man. They're tactical. They're seasoned. They're experienced. They will cut you down in the battlefield. So you, if you just got out of boot camp or basic, and you're out there fighting these guys and their elite forces who are seasoned veterans of 20 years of, of you know, urban combat in the Middle East, you know, clearing neighborhoods and, and fighting all kinds of guys in the jungles of Nam and in all the different scenarios of fields of battle, you, you're fighting the wrong guys, man. You're in trouble. And so that's what's going on with David's guys, just driving them back. Verse 9, Then Absalom met the servants of David. Absalom rode on a mule. The mule went under the thick boughs of a great terebinth tree and his head caught in the terebinth. So he was left hanging between heaven and earth. And the mule which was under him went on. Now a certain man saw it and told Joab and said, I just saw Absalom hanging in a terebinth tree. Hushai said, you need to go into the battle too. I believe that was part of the inspiration of the Lord when he sought to bring disaster upon Absalom. And I see in what happens to Absalom the hand of the Lord in this. So he is out there too, and he's in the battle. We, we've never read of Absalom having any kind of military experience, any kind of battle experience, and certainly he is no field commander. He's not the guy who's going to get out there in the field with his troops and start calling commands because he has this you know, this, this, this experience for battle and how to advance troops and when to retreat troops and, and when to tell troops to hold your position. He doesn't have that. He's just out there on his mule and he's going to make a show because he's the good-looking leader guy that everybody really loves. So you, you find him out there. And then something happens very strangely. Apparently, as, as David's men came, I suspect he's trying to get away. He's on his mule. He's riding hard. And he goes under a terebinth tree, which is like an oak tree. And if you know anything about oak trees, their wood is very dense. They're extremely strong. So it appears it, it, it's in a thick area. Remember, he had long hair. And so it's most probable to me that he got his hair, he wrapped it up, and he probably secured it with a leather strap so that it didn't fall in his eyes. It didn't become a problem, but it, it, it's well secured to his head somehow. He goes under this terebinth tree, the branches are down, and one of these thick enough branches gets down up into his hair, and just the mule keeps on going, and he's hanging. Some commentators said, well, it may not be his hair. It doesn't say his hair. It may have caught him by his head around his neck. Well, if you're riding on a mule fast, and a branch does this to you, what do you think the trauma is going to happen to your neck? It's going to bust your Adam's apple, probably break your neck. I don't think he got caught by his head. I'm pretty sure when we look at this, he got caught by his hair. Remember we read earlier that once a year he would cut his hair, only once a year. It was a long hair, and then he would weigh it. Now we got four and a half pounds this year. That's pretty good. I mean, the guy had hair makes some of you guys jealous. It just grew and grew and grew and just... This, you know, of course, all the girls like, oh, your hair is so pretty, Absalom. I love it and stuff. So he was pretty proud of his hair. And the thing it seems that he was so proud of would be his downfall. Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. So it, it makes sense he was on a mule. Now, he's, it says he was on a mule, not a donkey. A, a male donkey, they call them jacks, can breed a horse, a mare. And if they have a kid, it's called a mule. You will see them. They got the bigger, straighter ears. They're not horses, but they're often as big as a horse. And a lot of guys, 
when they get out into the country in the wilderness, they like to ride mules. So it's a bigger animal. He's, he's not on the, you know, Jesus came in on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. Those are smaller. Jerusalem donkeys actually have a cross on their back. There's a line that goes from their butt up to the half of the neck, and then there's another little stripe that actually comes right over the shoulder. And when you look at it, there's a, a cross on the back, and they call him a Jerusalem donkey. And they say, well, this is probably the one Jesus rode. We don't know, but it's pretty cool. They're short. So if you went under a branch, you would get caught, and your feet would probably hit the ground. But if you're on a mule, the back of your mule is this high, and you got like a foot and a half, two feet under you, your hair's in the trees, you're, you're trying to take it out, but you can't get this branch out because you're hanging and all the weight is pulling on your hair, which is secured probably with this leather strap, and you don't want to cut your hair with your sword off because your hair is so pretty. You're trying to get yourself off, and he's just stuck. It's, it's reasonable. I, there's nothing miraculous about that. It's just one of those things where God made sure that the right branch that was big enough that it could get right into that spot in his hair and suspend him between heaven and earth, the scripture says. So he was just hanging around, just, you know, with nothing to do. It was a hairy situation. And it would bring him lots of trouble. Verse 11, so Job said to the man who told him, you just saw him? Why did you not strike him there to the ground? I would have given you ten shekels of silver and a belt. But the man said to Joab, If I were to receive a thousand shekels of silver in my hand, I would not raise my hand against the king's son. For in our hearing the king commanded you and Abishai and Ittai, saying, Beware lest anyone touch the young man Absalom. Otherwise I would have dealt falsely against my own life. For there is nothing hidden from the king, and you yourself would have set yourself against me. So he goes back and he tells Joab, man, you ain't going to believe what I just saw back in the woods. What did you see? Absalom's hanging in a tree. He's stuck in his air. He's just hanging right there. And Joab wants to know, then, why didn't you kill the guy? I, well, you, you just saw him? That's all you did was see him? Why didn't you kill him, man? Joab is also a soldier. He's the commander of David's troops. He's a warrior by vocation. It's his job to stop the enemy. And the best way to stop the enemy is to kill the leader. Like they're trying to do to David, Joab knows that. So Joab is thinking in his mind as a soldier, if you would have killed Absalom, who would they have followed? If you would have done that, it would have been game over. And then he says, I would have given you 10 shekels in a belt. You guys are thinking, I got a couple of belts in my closet. That sounds like a dead deal. Well, when Job says, I would have given you a belt, it probably would have been a type of a warrior's belt. It would have been commemorative. It would have been something that this, this certain man who's unnamed would have put on and his fellow soldiers would have recognized and said, whoa, dude, what did you do to earn that? What do we give when soldiers do something commendable in the battlefield? You get a medal, man. You'll have right there on your chest, some medal that will commemorate something that you did in the field of battle, at war, of that nature. And so that's what that belt, that's when he said, I would have given you a belt. No, it's not that old leather belt you got hanging in the closet. You know you want to give it to the Salvation Army. You hate to let it go. The wife told you, get rid of it. It's old, it's ugly, it's nasty, but you've always loved that belt. That's been your, it's not that belt. So that's the idea here, because I think, I remember when I'd read that, I'd say, who wants a belt? So all you're going to give me is a belt, big deal. Now, it would have been something that this, this warrior would have said, yeah, I was, you know, presented that belt by Joab because, you know, I, I killed Absalom, and I, I got a medal for that, man. I killed the commander of the opposing forces. That, that gets you something, you know, uh, in, in a battlefield. But the certain man says, no, it doesn't matter what you gave me. I'm following the king's order. Somebody above you, and you heard. He told all you guys... It, again, it was public, and you should have known, so I, I'm not going to do it. So really, you see that this certain man who's unnamed is a man that we want to be like because he's a man of integrity. He's a man of integrity. It's not about the money. It's not about the medal. It's not about the fame. It's not about everybody talking about me and what I did, my bragging rights. It's about what the king said that we shouldn't do. And the king said, man, don't mess with Absalom. Be gentle to him. He even says, beware don't mess with them. So to me, that was more important. So I, I see that as integrity. One guy shared one time, I thought a great definition of integrity. 
It's simply doing the right thing when nobody's looking. If you do the right thing when everybody is looking, it does not mean you're a man of integrity. You should do that. You should always do the right thing. But when you do the right thing, what God wants you to do, and nobody is looking and nobody will know, you are a man of integrity. Because it's what God said. It's the right thing. It's always right because God is always looking. It's so important. We always take the high road. Sometimes there's two roads in ethic to take. The low road of ethics says, I can do this, and you can't fault me with having done anything wrong. It may not look the straightest, but I can do it. The high road says, I'll never do anything that might even look questionable. 1 Thessalonians 5 says, give no appearance of evil. Don't even make people wonder, because the high road of ethic and the integrity always says, I want to do what the most right thing is that's possible. And that's this guy right here, man. He wants to make sure that it looks... He said, I would have acted against my own safety. And the king would have found out I could have got killed. And you know what? The king might have told you to kill me, and you probably would have did it. Oh, you'd have been glad Absalom was dead. But you know what? You would have had no problem carrying out the king's order if I'd have got myself in trouble. So uh, I, I'm not going for that, Joab. I'm, I did what the king wanted me to do. Verse 14, then Joab said, I cannot linger with you. And he took three spears in his hand and he thrust them through Absalom's heart while he was still alive in the midst of the terebinth tree. And ten young men who bore Joab's armor surrounded Absalom and struck him and killed him. So Joab blew the trumpet and the people returned from pursuing Israel. For Joab held back the people. And they took Absalom and they cast him into a large pit in the woods and laid a very large heap of stones over him. Then all Israel fled, everyone to his tent. So when the guy shared these things with Job, Job was not a man of integrity. Job was a, was a warrior. And if he had to do something underhanded, he would. Remember back earlier, Abner, I believe it was in chapter 3, made peace with David. David sent him off on a mission. And when Job came back and he heard that Abner had been there, he he. he sent somebody to bring Abner back and he said hey Abner good to see you man I know everything's cool hey can we have just a little chat and he took him off to the side of the gate and he knifed him he killed him David said man I have I have no fault in this matter later on we saw last week Amasa is the commander for Absalom later on things will be okay with him and David again but guess what Joab again will pretend to be the friend and will take a sword, and under the auspices of, of, of camaraderie, he'll knife Amasa too. David, to his son Solomon, will tell him on his deathbed, Job has been nothing, and I'm paraphrasing, but trouble to me. Son, you see to it, you take care of Joab. And he notes that he killed Abner, and he killed Amasa, but it's interesting. He doesn't say anything about the killing of his son Absalom. Just those two guys, David mentions. You get him for having killed these two guys. But he doesn't say nothing about this. So Joab doesn't want to linger with this guy. He takes three spears, and there is Absalom suspended. Imagine the feeling of Absalom at this point. Trying to get out of this tree, he is stuck. I'm sure there are people around fighting and stuff. And all of a sudden, here comes his cousin, Joab. His cousin. Joab is his cousin. And Joab's got three spears. I don't know if Joab is walking. I don't know if Joab's on a mule too. But Joab's coming. And I don't think Joab just made it quick. I bet you Joab walked up and had that look. And Joab just seems to be the kind of guy that he's going to walk up and face you as you're hanging. And he's going to let you know for the few moments of life that you've got left. I'm going to take you down right now, Absalom. Imagine your own cousin. You know, you're going to put three spears into your cousin. He's got 10 armor bears with him. I don't think he has that much armor, but he's got 10 armor bears with him. And he tells each one of them, you guys strike them too. And I believe when he says strike them, they've got their swords. So it's, it's not going to be pretty. For each concubine of David that he defiled, 10 of them, there'll be a man besides Joab who will strike them. So you can imagine having three spears through your midsection and then you've got 10 other guys coming and striking you too. You could imagine what Absalom looked like 
hanging in the cherubim tree, pretty wiped out. So no doubt somebody took their sword, cut his hair, and it says they found a pit. They threw him in the pit, and they threw many stones on him. He didn't get an honorable burial because he was not an honorable man. And they threw many stones because I believe the intention was so many stones on there that nobody would want to try to unbury him. If Job threw three spears and ten men struck him and you threw a very large pile of stone on this guy, I don't believe they walked up and they laid the stones on Absalom, but that they found the pit and just started chucking stones to exhume his body would have, have been to brought out hamburger. And so I think that is part of the intention of Joab. You will not get an honorable funeral and your body will be so decimated and destroyed and smashed. You've been chopped up already, but now you're going to be smashed up, and nobody's going to even want to unbury you, buddy. So that is the, the place where he's going to die. You know, that, that, that's what's going to happen. And then it says, Israel fled when they heard their leader was dead. That's, that's what Hushai said. You know, word got out. Job blew the trumpet because he knew there's no need to fight. And so the trumpet call was one of Everybody come back. It wasn't a retreat. It was just a call to gather back from the battle. There'd be a distinctive bugle for that. And as they all gathered back and word gets out and people know Absalom's dead, the rest of the forces that were Absalom's, they headed home. They got out of there and thought, man, there's been a great slaughter. A bunch of our guys are dead. We haven't hardly killed any of them guys. Abs what's the purpose of fighting? Everybody goes. Verse 18. Now Absalom in his lifetime had taken and set up a pillar for himself, which is in the king's valley. We know that as the Kidron Valley today. For he said, I have no son to keep my name in remembrance. He called the pillar after his own name. And to this day, it is called Absalom's monument. Proverbs 27, 2. Let another man praise you and not your own mouth, a stranger and not your own lips. Don't blow your own trumpet. Don't say, man, I'm the great guy. Which, how many of you would agree with me how great I am? The Bible says don't do that. For a man to extol his own glory is no glory at all, the Scripture says. But that's what Absalom did. I got no son to, to carry my name on, so I'm going to build me a pillar. It's going to be a monument. Back in chapter 14, it said he had three sons and a daughter, and he named the daughter Tamar after his raped sister. So it's only probable that somehow these three young sons of his perhaps contracted something in their young ages and they died as young kids. Remember when the Black Plague went through the United States? And you, I remember up by uh, Bernie. You know where Bernie, California is? Uh, there's a lake up there by Bernie Falls, but there's a lake back there. Oh, what's the name of that lake? Nope, it's not Bernie Lake. Good try. I may be old, but I'm not that old yet, Russ. Anyways, out of the campground there, you can go to, a, to an old uh, cemetery back in the hills. Apparently, there was a community back there. And when you get there, I just, there's just something about old cemeteries. It's just, it's history. You just, and you walk through there, and you see the names, and you realize this family lost three kids in one year. What would it have been like to be a mom and a dad when the Black Plague came through there, and you lose three kids within one year because there was no cure for them. There was no physicians. You just got sick. You, you try to nurse them, and they just died. So perhaps Absalom's children died, and so he, he erects this monument to himself. We know earlier in 1 Samuel 15, 12, Saul set up a monument to himself at Carmel. Saul was about himself. He had big ego. Absalom was about himself. He had big ego. And so there in the Kidron Valley today, when you go to Israel, you will go by Absalom's monument, which is actually probably the original one fell. And many, many years back, they probably built the secondary one to replace it. An Orthodox Jew, when they travel through there, when they go by Absalom's monument, it's their tradition to spit at the monument. That's what they think about Absalom. So Absalom, you are remembered, buddy, just like you wanted to be. 
opened out for any of the reasons that you wanted to be remembered. You were remembered as a bad guy, and they still spit on you to this day. How sad. How sad that is for him. Verse 19. Then Ahimeaz, the son of Zadok, said, Let me run now and take the news to the king how the Lord has avenged him of his enemies. And Joab said, You shall not take news this day, for you shall not take the, or you shall take the news another day. But today you shall take no news, because the king's son is dead. Then Joab said to the Cushite, Go tell the king what you've seen. So the Cushite bowed himself to Joab, and he ran. And Ahimeaz, the son of Zadok, said again to Joab, But whatever happens, please let me also run after the Cushite. And Joab said, Why will you run, my son, since you have no news today? But whatever happens, he said, Let me run. So he said to him, Run. Then Ahimeaz ran by way of the plain, and he outran the Cushite. Remember that this was the, the Zadok and Abiathar, their sons. They, they would get news, give it to their sons. They would tell the young gal. The young gal would go out to David's people, and that's how David set up his spy network and his communication network. Now Ahimeaz wants to go tell the king about the battle and, and the good news. We won. But Joab says, ah, you better not do it. The son died today. I don't think Joab really wants David to get the news quite yet about his son dying, and David's going to want to know how and who, and guess what? It's Joab. But he sends the Cushite. Interesting. The Cushite is actually a, a, a foreigner. That's the northern part of Africa as we know it today. So he's from that area, but he was a, a, a proselyte to Judaism. He was part of this group. So he sends him, you, you, take the news to him don't really know what he is thinking so Ahamea says again I, I, I want to take the news he goes you don't have nothing ready and he says it again he says all right he just run run buddy and so finally relenting he, he he sends him out there and then we pick it up now David was sitting between the two gates and the watchman went up to the roof over the gate to the wall lifted his eyes and he looked and there was a man running alone then the watchman cried out and told the king and the king said if he's alone there's news in his mouth and he came rapidly and drew near and the watchman saw another man running and the watchman called to the gatekeeper and said there's another man running alone and the king said he also brings news so the watchman said i think the running of the first is like the running of ahamiah the son of zadok and the king said ah oh, he's a good man and he comes with good news. So, so that's how you sent information. You had runners. These guys are like cross-country track stars. They could run long distances. They're marathon runners. It's what they do. And so the Cushite gets a lead, and he's going however the path takes him. But Ahamez is a little sharper. He says, I'm going to take the plane. It's flatter. You're running through treacherous country. I'm going to run hard. And he actually beats the Cushite there. When he's running, the guy on the wall says, the way the guy runs, I could tell who that is. That's definitely Ahimeaz. In the book of, of Kings, it talks about a man by the name of Jehu. And he wanted to give trouble to another. He wasn't a king yet, but to King Joram. And it was said when they were riding their, their chariots in, somebody said, I could tell that's Jehu, the son of Nimshi, the way he drives his chariot, for he drives furiously. <laughs> so when this guy drove his chariot, man, he drove it recklessly. I mean, it just, he tore chariots up, I guess, because the guy knew who it was just by the way he drove the chariots. Maybe some of you guys are known for your driving like that. You know, they see you coming through the desert. You always have the big dust cloud. It's your car we can hear out in the sage as, you know, the bottom end's banging on the desert floor and everything's bouncing around. And they, oh, yeah, that's Gil coming. He drives furiously. So Ahimeaz in his running, he was very distinctive. We know who it is. And David says he's a great guy. I like that guy. He, he's a good man. Good news. Verse 28 says, So Ahimeaz called out and he said to the king, All is well. Then he bowed down with his face to the earth before the king and he said, Blessed be the Lord your God, who has delivered up the men who raised their hand against my Lord the King. And the king said, Notice, is the young man Absalom safe? 
He didn't say, that is great news. We won the victory. Are they retreating? That is great news to hear. How many did we lose? I hope we didn't lose a lot of guys. That is great news to hear. Is the area clear? Are we safe? Rather, he says, how's my son doing? How's the young man doing, man? Absalom. How did he fare in the battle? And Ahimea's answered. He said, when Joab sent the king's servant, me your servant, I saw a great tumult but I did not know what it was about. And the king said, turn aside and stand here. So he turned aside and he stood still. Just then the Cushite came and the Cushite said, for there's good news, my lord, the king, for the Lord has avenged you this day of all those who rose against you. Notice the same message, basically, that Ahimaaz brought. Job said, you ain't got no news, you go. But the news they both shared was the same news. Here's the only difference. And the king said to the Cushite, is the enemy retreating? Did we lose a lot of people? Did we have a great victory? Are we safe now? He says the same thing. Is the young man Absalom safe? So the Cushite answered and said, May the enemies of my lord the king and all who rise against you to do you harm be like that young man. That's a long way of saying two words. He's dead. You got it, brothers. He's dead. That's an eloquent, poetic kind of, so why didn't Ahamea say it? Well, he didn't have news. He knew he was dead. Job said, you can't tell the king why, because his son died today. Ahamea knew it, but he didn't want to tell David. He wasn't willing to tell David. It's interesting that, that the way he held it back. They knew the command. He knew he was dead. What's that? You know, all is well, but all is not as well. So, so... Absalom has died. I heard a bearded sage say it once. If you play stupid games, you win stupid prizes. Absalom played a stupid game, and he won a stupid prize. I'm going to credit Chris with sharing that with us tonight, a bearded sage. I, I told you that would preach. That would come across the pulpit real quick. You know, when he said it, I went, that's profound. I mean, yeah, you play stupid games and you're going to win a stupid prize. And so he got stuck up in a tree, got killed, and he died. And so David gets the news of his son. Same news. And notice this last verse, 33. Then the king was deeply moved and he went up to the chamber over the gate. That's the gate where he was sitting. And he wept. And as he went, he said thus, Oh, my son Absalom. My son, my son, Absalom, if I had only died in your place. Oh, Absalom, my son, my son. David is deeply moved. David's soul is torn. He's crying out. There's a deep anguish of a father over his son, the death of his son. Absalom hated his father. Absalom wanted to kill his father. He was bitter. But you know what? Absalom did not have enough hate to stop his father's love for him. And that's the true love of a father. You know, you love your children. And they could be rogues and rascals. They, they want to be your worst enemy. They could be your Absalom. But a father has so much love, he'll still love his son despite all that. So, so Absalom, you had a lot of hate. But hate never wins over love, does it? We know that from the Word of God. And the love that David had for him was so much greater. So much greater that he says, I wish it was me who had died and not you, my son. It's like saying, I wish you would have killed me first before you had to die. Even though he is everything that he was, David is still crying. I find David's love is, is, is quite interesting. It's, it's quite deep because of all that Absalom sought to do. I saw that... that when he was gone, David, when he brought him back, didn't even want to talk to him. But yet when he dies, David is, is torn and brokenhearted. When you read about this and the different commentators will say, well, you know, the sin of David has brought this on. And that's true. You could look at Absalom and say the sin of Absalom has brought this on. It's his just reward. And that's true. But who has the right to judge the heart of a father that has just lost his son who he loves? 
Nobody has the right to judge David's heart on this one. And so my heart breaks for David as David's heart is broken over his son. We'll see in chapter 19, David will continue to grieve. Oh, my son, deal gently with the young man. But when he is dead, it's dad grieving for his son, not one general, not one king grieving for another general or another king. This is personal to David. David is broken hearted. He sees, he, he realized he has lost a third son and there's no way to reconcile this. So Lord willing, we get together next week, chapter 19. We're going to pick up with David's heart broken right where we leave off tonight with his heart broken.